Live from Case at 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Election night has finally arrived, and we are just one hour away from polls closing here in Bear County. We have seen some long and contentious races this year, as well as historic record breaking voter turnout nationwide. It will likely be hours, if not much long, if much longer before we see some returns, including the race for the presidency. But we're going to be working well into the night, bringing you the latest results and fact checking along the way. We also have election team coverage all night long for you, and we begin at the heart of all that's been happening since early voting began. Bear County Elections Headquarters. Yeah, after record breaking early voting numbers, a much more subdued turnout today. Dylan Collier is live with more on what we have seen so far. Dylan. Stephen Myra, the county had relatively strong numbers this morning, around 7,500 votes per hour, but that figure dipped this afternoon to around 6,600 votes. Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan going as far as to lower her expectations for the day, hoping that we would have 100,000 votes countywide. Even that milestone will be tough to reach unless we see a surge over the next hour as the polls begin to close around Bear County at 7 o'clock. Still, voter turnout of over 60 percent for this election is something that Callanan says everybody can celebrate. I think what it's proving... We have this wonderful, energized election, but when we get right down to it, Bear County likes to vote early. We've always seen that. Callanan says to expect the release of the early voting in mail-in ballot totals around 7.05, so just over an hour from now. And because those totals will be a vast majority of the total vote in Bear County, we should have a pretty good idea at that point of how some of the races here in Bear County are going to shake out. Now, one of the most contentious battles is for Texas Congressional District 23. Our Courtney Friedman has been reporting on the Gina Ortiz-Jones campaign, and she is following her tonight. Courtney? Yeah, Dylan, thank you so much. I'm here outside of her headquarters right now. This is a campaign I have followed before. The last time she was running against incumbent representative Will Hurd, and she lost by less than 1,000 votes. This time she's up against Republican Tony Gonzalez, a fellow veteran and political newcomer. And this is a big district. Congressional District 23 is enormous, spanning about 58,000 square miles from San Antonio to El Paso, along about 600 miles of the Mexican border. Jones is hoping to flip the district blue. She has always pushed health care as one of her main issues, and that's only intensified during this campaign. Health care is on the ballot. Character, character is on the ballot. Leadership and integrity is on the ballot. And that's why I'm so hopeful about what we're going to do. But as we know, hope is not a strategy, right? We've got to get everybody out to vote. Just yesterday, the Democratic National Committee Chair Tom Perez chose to spend the day before the election right here in San Antonio rallying for Democrats like Ortiz Jones. Today, she's been visiting local polling sites, including Adams Hill Elementary and Peace Middle School, where she went to school growing up. And again, we are out here outside of her campaign headquarters. We're expecting to hear from her in a press conference at 7 o'clock. We'll hopefully be able to stream that. But either way, we'll be bringing you updates here all night. We'll be here as the numbers keep coming through. For now, we're live from the Medical Center. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Myra. All right, thanks, Courtney. And running against Ortiz, Ortiz Jones is Republican Tony Gonzalez, who has been endorsed by President Donald Trump and the congressman who is not seeking re-election in District 23, Will Hurd. And to me, it's not about a party. You know, it's not about being a Republican or a Democrat or independent. It's about this country. And my candidacy has been about bringing this country back together. Our Tim Gerber is following Tony Gonzalez's campaign tonight. We had a live report from him at five o'clock today for a full preview of this race and that live report head to ksat.com. You know, political campaigns have been relying on social media to sway voters, even as many of their supporters and opponents have been slugging it out on Facebook and Twitter. Jesse Degriado says social media is now very much a part of the political landscape, but it's not without pitfalls which voters should avoid. Many may say social media has become a political force in and of itself. Is it toxic, dangerous, out of control, or is it productive in actually helping to further democracy? 
I think it can be toxic and I think it, it can be productive. The UTSA political scientist with expertise in political psychology says, for instance, not only has Facebook been urging its users to get out and vote, it has voter information as well. Online discussions also have played a part in record voter turnouts. But he says hateful posts condemning others actually are counterproductive. We're not leading them to, you know, uh, take our point of view or vote for our candidate anymore. We're just pushing them away. Posts encouraging violence, he says, can be flagged or, if needed, reported to law enforcement. Other posts that lack credibility or seem likely untrue, he says, should be verified using websites like factcheck.org and KSAT's own Trust Index. If we see claims online, um, that seem very dubious. We should research them uh, using these tools. And if we, you know, and they haven't previously been submitted, we should submit them ourselves. So that voters, he says, can be truly informed, hopefully before they cast their ballots. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. And as Jesse mentioned, our KSAT Trust Index is a reliable source for fact-checking dubious claims. And tonight, the team is monitoring misinformation in real time. You can find more information about their efforts as well as flag content yourself right now at KSAT.com. Continuing our team election coverage over on the southwest side of the city, voters lining up at Johnston Branch Library on Medina Base Road to cast their votes before the polls close in less than an hour now at 7 o'clock. Our Devin Clark is there live to give us a closer look at how things are shaping up out there, Devin. Hey, Mario, good evening. Yes, it is an exciting event out here. All the voters we're speaking to say that they are so happy to be able to cast their vote in this election, this historic event. And of course, out here at Johnston Branch Library, it is safety first. All the voters getting these plastic blue gloves so that they can wear them and not actually touch the screens with their bare hands. We do want to mention, though, that there is a pretty lengthy line. If you take a look, it wraps around the entire building on three sides. We just spoke to a voter who casted his ballot not long ago. He said he actually waited about an hour and 45 minutes. We're hearing from others that it was a little bit less than that. But either way, people say that they do not mind. They all reiterated the importance of this election. Here in Precinct 1, we're waiting to see who the new county commissioner is for this area after 15 years. But of course, the overwhelming turnout has a lot to do with the presidency. The candidates, President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden, two men with very different views on issues like race relations, policy, health care, etc. And what many are calling the most contentious election of our lives, voters here know how much is on the line. I haven't voted in years. And so this year has been, has been, I guess, one of the worst years with the COVID. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be voting today. It's very important, very, very important. This is in every, in every aspect of it. So it felt awesome. I was just having that conversation with my seven-year-old son and, and explaining to him the whole process. It's, it's, uh, it's overwhelming and exciting at the same time. And while the line here outside of the Johnston Branch Library does wrap around three sides of this building, we do want to mention that before we got here, we were at Palo Alto College, which is about 10 minutes of the way, virtually no lines at all. So for anyone out there with any time constraints and wants to come to the southwest side or south side area and vote, Palo Alto College is another option. And right now we want to get over to our Stephen Cavazos, who is live on the west side at a polling location with what he's seeing here. Stephen. Well, Devin, if you can hear, those mariachis are keeping things very lively out over here at Las Palmas Branch Library. Now, with less than an hour to go before polling sites close, voters we talked to say that they want to make sure that their ballots are in and that their voices are heard. Now, again, we are here at Las Palmas Branch Library on the city's west side. We met several people who say that they haven't encountered any problems at this polling site. We also met mother and son, Ruby and Ryan Marmolejo, who voted for the very first time, and they did it together. They say they wanted to make it a family of fair and tell us that they're voting for the future. It may not make a difference right now for me, but later on for my kids, it, hopefully I would, I would like to think it would make a difference for them. It's my first time voting and I feel good about it. And this is like the time that we have our little chance not to speak, but you know, just to vote. 
Now again, polling sites are expected to close by 7 tonight and over here at Las Palmas Branch Library. It was a little bit slow this afternoon, but has been picking up over the last few minutes. Now, one of the races that we are keeping a very close eye on tonight is that of District 19 of the Texas State Senate. Republican Senator Pete Flores faces Democratic opponent, Texas State Representative Roland Gutierrez. Now, this is a very large legislative district in the country, and we're going to have more on that race tonight and on KSAT.com. Myra. All right. Thank you, Stephen. It's great to see so many people out there still waiting in line to cast their vote. I just like the mariachis were entertaining people as they wait in line. Giving it some flavor, yeah. making it an event, right? Just a reminder, we have three election live streams coming your way. The next begins during the show at 630 and will continue on KSAT.com and on the KSAT TV app starting at 7 o'clock. We also have two more live streams set for tomorrow at 7 a.m and 7 p.m. And right now on KSAT.com, we're giving you the opportunity to choose how to watch this election night. You can pick from our selection of election day streams, including watch parties for both presidential candidates, reporters at polling sites, and Bear County election headquarters. We've provided a link on our homepage for you to get there. We'll be right back. I'm Garrett Berger. I'll be covering the three city sales tax propositions. The latest coming up. Medical director for San Antonio Metro Health and the Bear County Med Public Health Authority. It is 613 on Tuesday, November 3rd, Election Day here in the United States. And that means you have 47 minutes left to go vote. If you haven't cast your vote, and please, we hope that you do. This is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight, we're reporting 298 new cases of COVID-19, bringing the cumulative total to 66,529 since this pandemic began. The seven day moving average has jumped up to 227. So the trend from the past few weeks has continued. We are seeing a definite increase in new cases. So that calls on you and everyone you know to be vigilant about the public health guidance, wearing a mask, physical distancing, et cetera. Fortunately, we do have no new deaths to report tonight, but so many of our loved ones and neighbors have been lost. So please keep them and their families in your prayers. In our hospitals, we're also seeing a slight uptick in the numbers. Tonight, we have 240 COVID-19 patients in the hospital, which is up seven from yesterday. This includes 31 new COVID-19 related missions over the last 24 hours. We do have 104 patients in the ICU, up eight from yesterday, and 46 patients on ventilators this evening. Finally, uh, Tuesday, we do take a look at our schools, and so a message to all of you teachers, school administrators, and parents out there. With the numbers going up, now is the time to be particularly cautious. We do not recommend that schools expand the number of in-person learners right now. Stay the course. Let's all watch the numbers together. And of course, let's be even more vigilant about wearing masks, practicing physical distancing, washing hands, and practicing good hygiene as well. Let me turn it over to Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And I tell you what, if there's ever a time for us to be careful and handle ourselves right and doing the uh, things that we preach about every day, uh, now's the time to do it. I was looking back on some data in the summer when we got in serious trouble. And of course, people were not wearing ma face masks then because the governor had taken it away. But just to show you how quickly uh, things can change on you. On June the 13th, we had 230,000, 230, 230 case, uh, cases, excuse me, uh, and then it jumped very quickly on uh, three days later, 400, uh, five days later, 538, six days later, 638, two days later, 795, hitting then a total high count of 1,688 on June the 22nd. So we cannot let that happen again, and we're going to have to be really, really careful uh, over these next several weeks because we're fighting the COVID, we're fighting the weather. Uh, uh, so we, we, we've got a lot of issues to be on top of. So everybody just be very careful. We don't want to see what happened to us this summer happen again. Uh, we still have 12 patients from El Paso in the hospital. No, no, 18, what, 18, excuse me, 18. And that's driven our numbers up because we've never had to take uh, patients from um, from El Paso. So that's kind of infecting affecting our hospital numbers also. Uh, let me close real quick about the election. I just talked to Jackie Callahan a few minutes ago. She's an election administrator. Let me tell you, they're doing a great job out there. Uh, you know, we're manning 302, I think it is, polling places today. 
and we're starting to run out of voters. Uh, we had about 80,000, we think, will vote by the end of this next 45 minutes, unless we have a big swamp right at the end. But that 80,000, when you add it to what the early vote is, means we're going to exceed 700,000. That's 150,000 more people going to the polls today than went four years ago in the last presidential election. Now, a couple of things that we need to be aware of. If you postmarked your ballot, your mail-in ballot, before Election Day, you have to, till tomorrow to have it counted. So if they get any more of those in, they'll be able to count those. And if you're military, you have six days to get it in. So we won't have all the military ballots uh, till, till the six days have expired. Those are laws, and we follow those laws. So uh, the good thing about it today, too, is that we've had no ugly incidents at the poll. You know, you always have this little squabble sometime between poll workers, but nothing significant today. And so I want to thank the voters uh, very, very much for uh, being uh, uh, very attuned to uh, acting the right way when they went to vote, uh, being respectful of each other, being respectful of the judges and the people that work very hard to put on these elections. So thank you so very much for doing that. Right, thank you, Judge. I also want to say thank you to the volunteer election judges that are out there. Many of those folks that are working the polls this evening are your neighbors. Uh, they're your friends, residents of San Antonio, and they deserve a hearty thanks from us all. We know that many people are hurting in this pandemic, and if you need some assistance with paying rent or mortgage, we have assistance available to you. Simply call 311 or visit the website covid19.sanantonio.gov for our information on our emergency housing assistance program. Also, if you're out of work, if you need uh, if you need to get back into work, uh, there are jobs available. And for, th for those folks who need the skills training to get into those jobs, high wage jobs, we have skills training available to you right now. You can call All right, it's a troubling trend that continues tonight with seeing more and more cases in Bear County. 298 new cases confirmed. That brings the total to 66,529, but it brings the seven day average, which they say is more reflective of a 24 hour period to 227 cases. No new deaths to report, but hospitalizations also up and uh, the mayor asking schools to stay the course at this point. He said it's time to be particularly cautious for school administrators, teachers, staff, students as well. Uh, he says that Metro Health is not recommending schools expand in person learning right now as we are seeing these numbers increase. Uh, the judge there did mention some numbers that we're happy to talk about when it comes to voting. Uh, you heard Jackie Callanan say at five o'clock things were a little lackluster in terms of turnout that they expected for Election Day, but in all it is looking like there will be 700 100,000 people plus who have voted in total from early voting combined with today, which is 150,000 more people than voted in all of 2016. Yeah, and there's still about 40 minutes left to vote. If you are in line at seven o'clock, you will be allowed to vote. And just anecdotally, uh, the live shots that we saw from Stephen Cavazos and Devin Clark, there were people in line at some of the voting sites uh, on the south side. So that's something to be aware of. We could still hit the $100,000 that was projected, but right now they've downgraded that to about 80,000 they expect to vote today. We'll see what happens. Yeah, let's turn to the weather now. That's certainly not a factor uh, for voters today, which was good news for people heading out to the polls, Adam. Yeah, it's always good news for turnout, especially in states and locations where wintry weather and wintry precipitation can affect voter turnout. Of course, around here, we don't have to worry about that. But overall, it was just a nice day. Whereas 2016, we actually had some decent rainfall on Election Day. I wish we could have had some clouds and squeezed some of the rain out today, but that wasn't the case. We just had some high thin clouds. We'll have some morning fog tomorrow. Warmer mornings are on the way. We'll gradually see those morning readings on the rise and a hint of humidity back in the air by Friday. All right, let's take a look at our beautiful sunset this evening, which of course with the time change, I don't know about you, but I'm still getting used to it. 545 PM is sunset and we started the day at 43, made it up to 80 for the afternoon high, which is just three degrees above average and seven degrees shy of the record. Hondo's at 71. Bernie, at least Bernie Stage Airfield, always likes to drop off pretty quickly. Right now at 63, Bulverde 72, Randolph at 65, and we're 70 down Pleasanton. But temperatures are falling off very quickly this evening. That chill is going to creep up on you. So for outdoor activities, have the jacket handy. And by early tomorrow morning, widespread 40s, even some low to mid 40s just north and west of San Antonio.
So this evening clear, generally calm. Temperatures falling down into the 50s just within a couple of hours here and tomorrow we'll start at 48 with the morning fog then make it up to 78. No big changes other than those morning lows rising a little bit day after day back into the 60s for mornings by Sunday and a cold front possibly next Tuesday. All right, thanks Adam. All right, some good news for the Aggies today, Greg. Yeah, they took a hit at the wide receiver during the opt outs and also injuries, but they got a key wide receiver back last week, and now he's going to be ready for the rest of the season as well. When we come back, we'll let you know who that is. And the Jaguars of Johnson look to stay undefeated against Roosevelt, one of the big games in our big game coverage coming up. I'm Courtney Friedman. I'll be reporting on Congressional District 23, and I'll be following Democrat Gina Ortiz Jones. I'll keep you updated on the latest. The fight Texas Aggies got an important piece of their offense back when wide receiver Hezekiah Jones made his 2020 debut in the Aggies 42-31 victory over Arkansas. Jones has been sidelined since he ruptured his Achilles tendon in the Aggies 2019 fall camp. And when Jamon Osmond announced he's opting out this season, Cam Buckley and Caleb Chapman went down with season-ending injuries. Jones was the only one with experience. Man, it was fun. It's been a while, about like a year and a half. I haven't played since 2018, so it's been fun to get back out there with the guys. I've uh, been missing my teammates for sure. Um, they've been doing a great, tremendous job uh, winning, and I'm just uh, happy to be out there to contribute. That now is given San Antonio's own Kellen Mon another target when the Aggies face the Gamecocks in South Carolina this Saturday at 6. Texas Longhorns have opened as a seven and a half point favorite when they host West Virginia Mountaineers this Saturday morning. Both teams come into this contest at four and two overall, three and two in the Big 12. The winner will stay in contention for the Big 12 title. The Longhorns beat the Mountaineers last year in West Virginia, 42 to 31. They're coming off a 41-34 victory in overtime against previously undefeated and six ranked Oklahoma State. As a result, this showdown features the number one offense in the Big 12 against the number one defense. The key to the game is, is can we block them consistently? We know they're going to make plays. Uh, they've made them against everybody that they played, everybody. Um, but uh, if we can make more plays uh, than they do, and if we can be consistent uh, in you know, not turning guys completely loose in the backfield, uh, then we'll, we'll have a shot to move the football. And you'll get to see the Longhorns face off against the Mountaineers at Royal Memorial Stadium in Austin this Saturday morning, 11 a.m., live right here on KSAT 12. The UTSA Roadrunners will look to get back on the winning track when they face the Rice Owls in Houston this Saturday afternoon. The Roadrunners have fallen to 4-4 four four on the season after their 24-3 loss on the road to Florida Atlantic. Now they'll try and rebound against a team that's only played two games due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is head coach Jeff Trailer's overall confidence level with his team coming off their first game this season, not scoring a touchdown? We're fine. We're fine. We're disappointed. Um, but, you know, we've got four games left, and we're four and four, and uh, there's not been one game we played this year where we didn't feel like we were totally outmatched or didn't have a chance to win. So we're, we're very confident. The game is set to kick off at 2.30 with no fans on Saturday in Houston. One of the big games in a big game coverage this week will be the number two ranked and undefeated Johnson Jaguars against 11th ranked Roosevelt Rough Riders. The Jaguars entered the game at 5-0, 4-0 in District 28-6A with new head coach Mark Soto, their best start in school history. While the Rough Riders' only loss this season was to Madison Mavericks 37-7, who the Jaguars, by the way, face next week. But first, this week, it's a battle between the number one and number three team in District. But I do know that they're a good football team. Of course, I've been seeing their record. Uh, of course, they're very disciplined, they, they, they know what they're doing, and it's going to be a, a tough challenge for us. We do not take this team lightly, and we know that the, um, the dangers of getting overconfident and over ahead of ourselves, and we take it. We start every week feeling like we're 0-0, zero, zero, we need to get to 1-0. The Johnson Jaguars and Roosevelt Rough Riders kick off Friday at 7.30 at Coma Lander Stadium. Let's head back to our newsroom now with more of our election coverage. You can hear it How right many? now, it's heating up. Our special coverage of election night 2020 starts right after this break. Historic voter turnout in Bear County. Just how historic? I'm Dylan Collier at election headquarters where we'll be tracking that very question throughout the night. As is the case with so many things in the year 2020, 
This is not a normal election night. Usually on election night at KSAT, we have all kinds of politicians and consultants and political scientists that join us live right here in the studio. That is not happening tonight. So we're doing a lot by Zoom and our guests at 630 are two people who maybe are on opposite sides of the aisle, but they know how to read numbers very well. Christian Archer is with Bear Facts. He's been a Democratic consultant in the past. Matt Makoviak is a uh, the campaign strategist and campaign manager for Tony Gonzalez. And, uh, you know, obviously you're in the middle of a heated race tonight, Matt. So I really appreciate you taking the time to join us quickly here live. First off, and, and I'll start with you, Matt. What are you seeing in the numbers today? Yeah, look, it's looked pretty steady today. Of course, it depends exactly which county you're looking at. At, um, but but I think we've seen heavy turnout in a lot of places. Uh, Bear had only like 17,000 votes as of 11 a.m., but it picked up as it went throughout the day. Um, I think the big question mark is going to be the Rio Grande Valley. Um, you know, the, the overall turnout, some of those counties were really down in early voting. Um, and that may not be a bad thing for us. That might be a, a bad thing for, for Gene Ortiz Jones in this particular race. And it certainly is a bad thing for Joe Biden uh, as he, in his effort to try to win Texas. So, uh, look, I think what you're going to see in a lot of these races is if the Democrats don't have a significant lead once the mail ballots, the, the, the absentees and the early votes are reported at seven, uh, they're not going to win because because I think Republicans are going to have a significant advantage, 10 or 20 point advantage on Election Day all across the state. So the Democrats can only win if they have a significant advantage. And the reason Trump's going to win Texas is he had, I believe, around 100,000 net vote advantage through early voting. So unless he lost election day, which isn't going to happen, uh, he's going to win Texas. Now the only real question is the margin. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, Matt, obviously I disagree. I think that when you look at the early vote numbers, when you look across early vote numbers in Harris, Travis, Bear, Dallas, even Collin County, Collin County, traditionally uber red county, that's going to go blue this cycle right now. Uh, and then when you look at the new voters, right, there are three million Texas early vote numbers. Um, that have never voted before. Usually they don't they don't vote for the incumbent um, and the undecideds usually break against the incumbent, which is Donald Trump. And I think for the first time, uh, Texas is obviously uber competitive. Uh, and I think that we're gonna see a blue wave across Texas. The Texas Democrats are gonna take back the Texas House and it will literally be a, te a tectonic shift in American politics if it happens. Do you think that, Christian, I'll stick with you for this one. Do you think that the numbers that we have seen in Bear County specifically today it was lackluster turnout compared to what the elections department was hoping for when it comes to turnout on election day, but record breaking, record shattering numbers for early voting. And we, of course, had an additional week there to do that as well. That factors in as, as well. So do you think, who does that help? Who, who does that favor? Well, I think the early vote, no doubt, helps the Democrats. I think that when you look at the total number of votes that were banked in early voting, they already surpassed the 2016 numbers. So I think that no matter who turns out today, we're already smashing through election numbers from 2016, which only benefits uh, the Democrats because it's a trending state. We're definitely trending blue. The only question is, at what year in this decade do we go fully blue? I think it's going to happen right now, Myra. So I think it helps the Democrats pretty dramatically. I think when you look at the, the state house seat, 121, Selena Montoya, um, I think that she's got a real chance to take that seat back. For the Democrats, I certainly think that it falls into the column of if Texas Democrats, if we're going to take back the Texas house, 121 with Selena Montoya will have to go our way tonight. All right, Matt, I want to give you a quick word here, your reaction to what Christian had to say. And I'm hearing of all the vote in Bear County, like 50% is coming from Precinct 3, which is part of, you know, a part of District 21 or 23. So your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, when Christian says Texas is going to go fully blue, I take that to mean that Biden's going to win Texas, that Cornyn's at risk. Uh, I don't I don't if he's making that claim, I'd, I'd like to know that. I doubt it because uh, I don't, I I don't think there's any. Pardon? He just said he is making that claim. You believe Biden's going to win Texas? I do. OK, well, you heard it here, folks. And, and fortunately, <laughs> since it's being being aired live, we'll be able to go back to it. Uh, we'll be happy to be happy to uh, wager a nice steak dinner, uh, if you like, uh, on this one. But look, Trump's going to win Texas. He's ahead through the early vote. He'll be ahead on uh, election night even more. But look, these are good questions. The suburbs are moving away from Republicans. This is a big concern. Uh, the new voters that are coming in, Christian said three million. We only had 8.7 million vote in early votes. So that would be like a third of the more than a third of the early vote. Yeah. 
I had never voted in Texas. Christian, that's simply not correct. About 10% of people who voted early hadn't voted previously in Texas. And you have to keep in mind, there are new movers, there are low propensity voters, there are new registrants. The, both parties uh, did a huge effort in that. In fact, the Republicans registered a net 150,000 more people in Texas since the 2018 election than the, than the Democrats did. So I don't, I'm not like whistling past Dixie here. There are some very, very, very close races. We have eight or nine competitive congressional races. We have one state Senate race. We have 20 or 25 state house races. And I'm not gonna say with certainty the Democrats won't take the Texas house back. I don't think they will. I think they'll net four or five or maybe six seats. It's gonna be really, really close. Uh, but ultimately the Republicans are gonna hold all these statewide seats. Trump's gonna win, I think by five points tonight once, once all the votes are counted. And the corn is gonna win by seven to 9%. Okay guys, and we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We have a couple of political strategists with us that are helping us kind of read the tea leaves out there and let us know what we should be looking at tonight. Christian Archer from Bear Facts, who has been a Democratic strategist in the past, and Matt McCoviak, who is a Republican strategist, who is the campaign manager for the Tony Gonzalez District 23 race. And Matt, I want to ask you a question about that specific race tonight. How sure. important is Bear County? I know it was very important. Uh, when Will Hurd ran, he felt like he needed to win Bear County with like 52% of the vote or something like that at least. Is that what you guys are eyeing to when these early numbers come out after seven? Yeah, it is. And keep in mind, the early numbers at seven only represent the early vote that was counted and the absentee ballots that have been received. It doesn't include election day. It doesn't include future absentee ballots to come in. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, look, if we win Bear County, we're going to win. And the reverse is true as well. If we lose Bear County, we're going to lose. I think uh, you know Uvalde and, and Medina are really important too. Those are counties where we need to have large margins and high turnout. Those are really strong Republican counties. I think uh, Tony's going to overperform uh, in the in the Valley. You know, he's been down there so much. He's in 12 counties today. Uh, he's doing three or four counties a day and has for two months. Uh, Gina's not really campaigning anywhere, uh, with very few exceptions. She's doing everything virtually. So, uh, and then I think we may even actually overperform in El Paso, as unlikely as that may be. Um, he's been out there quite a bit as well. So. I think Tony's going to do very well. I think he's going to overperform the president five, six, seven percent. Uh, I think the president's going to be at 45 to 47 percent in this district. Tony's got a great chance to win. I'd much rather be us than them. We've, we've been outspent, but we have done far, far, far more voter contact. And I think we've run a great campaign and we have a, a great candidate who's worked really hard to represent this district. Christian, let's turn to you. I know that you're keeping a really close eye on what's going to play out in the Texas House uh, tonight and how that may uh, shift the balance of power there. Races, you're watching and some of your predictions for those. Yeah, well, I, I think Matt mentioned it. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I think Gina Ortiz Jones is going to win the congressional seat tonight. I think when you look at, at suburban women, they are breaking away from the, the Republican Party and their failures um, in dealing with the coronavirus. They're going blue. Uh, in all the suburban neighborhoods, they're going uh, going blue. When you look at the senior vote, um, traditionally Republican uh, is breaking against Trump and is breaking against the Republicans and going Democrats. So I think in Bear County, I think that there is the the two congressional races, um, and I think Wendy Davis is going to make a real race out of, out of the the race against Chip Roy. Wouldn't surprise me if she won. Selena Montoya in 121 is going to be a close race, um, and there's a state senate race. Um, which happens to go right through Matt's backyard with the congressional race. Uh, that's going to be a, another hotly contested Senate District 19 between Ro uh, State Representative Gutierrez and uh, Senator Flores. That's going to be another great wait, uh, race for Bear County to watch. All right, Christian, I think you're going to stay with us. Matt, I'm going to let you go because I know it's election night for you. I know you got a lot going on. I appreciate your time. And I'm going to make a plug here before I let you go. If Tony wins tonight, I want to see him on our live stream. Can I make that plug? <laughs> We will do everything we can. We probably won't know tonight, <laughs> yeah. but we'll, we'll do everything we can. Appreciate okay. you guys. Yeah, sir. yeah. Take Thank care, you, Matt. Matt. Take care. We'll be right back. Yeah, Christian. We are continuing our election night 2020 coverage here as we wait for those polls to close just moments away now. We have Christian Archer with us, former Democratic strategist, head of Bear Facts. Christian, I have been waiting to ask you this all day long. <laughs> I want to get your take on whether you think there is a scenario in which we will know tonight who is going to be the next president? Oh gosh, Myra, I, I think it's great. You know, I think the, the numbers are gonna be coming in any second now in North Carolina, in Florida, in Georgia. Um, and if Biden were to win any of those three states, it's over. Um, I think when you look at the Rust Belt states, um, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, uh, if Biden were to win all three of those, it's over. 
Um, and then you factor in um, Texas, right? So I, I can't wait to cash in my steak dinner with Matt, but <laughs> I think Texas is 100% in play. So is Georgia. And then you look west to Arizona. Um, and Biden looks like Biden's going to um, win Arizona as well. So I think that, that really I would much rather be Joe Biden uh, than Donald Trump at this point. All right, but I want to I nail you down even further than that because we at KSAT and I think every news organization is being very careful about calling any race, not just the president's race, but tonight we are going to be very careful because, you know, you've got absentee ballots, you've got people that voted by mail, you've got early vote, you've got so many different things at play than normal. Do you think a presidential winner will be declared tonight? Steve, I do. I, I, I think that, I think that, you know, look, so long as Wisconsin and Michigan and the numbers look solid, um, Pennsylvania is going to be close, and I don't think they're going to be able to call Pennsylvania tonight. But any of those other states, any combination with Wisconsin and Michigan, and it, and it's by there, there's no possible map for Trump. If Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, Arizona were to fall to Biden tonight, there is no map that has um, President Trump being reelected. What so, I, and, and by the way, Steve, to answer that directly, I think we'll know that tonight. I don't think that we'll know the results of Pennsylvania tonight, or okay. maybe even Michigan, but the numbers might be so overwhelming in Michigan that while they're not finalized, um, they can call Michigan for, for Biden. I think we got about 40 seconds here quickly before we have to go to another break. What is at stake with the Texas House? I mean, this is not just a normal year for Texas House elections. Talk about that. Oh yeah, no doubt about that, Steve. I mean, you know, it's it's been so long. It's been it's been nearly 20 years since the Democrats have controlled the Texas House. But here's the thing, and it's sorry, it's Civics 101, but it goes right to redistricting and how the state is redistricted so unfairly right now against Democrats. If the Texas Democrats take control of the Texas House and elect a speaker, and I'll I'll tell you tonight, I think the speaker might come from San Antonio, it might be Trey Martinez Fisher, if the Democrats win. Um, and then there's just simply fair redistricting. So many more races in Texas become competitive, which juices the Democratic base turnout, and Texas changes forever. Making plenty of predictions. I know, man. Yeah. <laughs> by, the, by the way, we we're expecting to hear from Trey Martinez Fisher tonight during our live stream. So I'm going to tell him your prediction. Well, good. Put it on him. <laughs> All right, I will. Him. I will. We're going to continue our conversation right after this. Welcome back. We have a long list of guests weighing in tonight as the races and the results continue to come in once the polls close. But we are rounding out our conversation with our first this evening, Christian Archer with Bear Facts. I don't know that you can make any more predictions at this point, but I'm going to give you. <laughs> I bet he can. I'm <laughs> guessing he can. <laughs> He's always oh, I can. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, Trust me. Yeah. Well, what are some final thoughts you have as we tick towards the polls closing? Well, you know, I mean, I think that that, you know, obviously, as we're dealing with this pandemic, I think Bear County has done an amazing job of providing access to all of our voters. Um, so, I, I, you know, Jackie at, at Bear County Elections Office has done an amazing job. And I, and I love the, the civility of the process right now. We banked so many um, votes early across the board, Democrat or Republican. Um, Texas is showing up overwhelmingly to make sure their voices are heard. And in early voting, we superseded um, what had already voted in the previous presidential election. I think that's good for democracy. I think it's a great night for Bear County, and I think that change is coming to Texas. You know, there's so many people I've talked to, like I have a, a, a line of people that I talk to on election day. You are one of them. I have other people on both sides of the aisle that I talk to to just get a pulse for what's going on. I had a lot of people tell me they think this is what's going on, but when you have so many people who have not voted before in the state of Texas, that's a big question mark. I mean, a lot of people are guessing where they're going to go, but I've, I've had so much uncertainty in this election that more than I've ever had before. Oh, you know, Steve, it's such a it's such a strange time, right? Our, our politics has has become so divisive. And, uh, you know, I, Matt made a point about the Republican voter registration on the Democratic side of things. There's Move Texas, you know, for the last six years, they've done an amazing job of registering voters. Um, and so I, I think you're right. But but traditionally, when undecided and new people that get in the process usually don't stay on the side of the incumbents. And that's the Republican of Texas. Yeah. And I think that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, um, along with the other candidates, uh, provide a great alternative 
uh, to the status quo. And I think that suburban women and seniors, along with the newly registered, I think they're going to break heavily toward the Democratic Party tonight. We'll see what happens. Christian Archer, thanks so much for being with us. I know we're going to hear from you later on. He's going to join us again at 8 o'clock during the live stream and maybe make more predictions and more bets <laughs> with Republicans. We'll see. <laughs> Christian, always appreciate your time. Yeah, enjoyed it, Steve, Myra. We'll see you soon. We'll be right back. Okay.